Okay, so it's week six. Sorry, we, we didn't have class on Tuesday. Um, I uh, had to cancel class because my baby was sick. She's feeling better now, so nothing to worry about there. But yeah, daycares are super strict. Like they have policies. You know, if you if you have a kid with a fever, they don't want your kid, you know, sneezing and coughing all the other kids. And so they make you they make you come pick up your baby. And then it's like I just had her. And I mean, you you might say bring her in. You know, teach class with her here. But um, you know, not with her sick. She would cough on all of you lovely people. I don't want her to give you germs. So. Maybe someday I can bring her to campus and you can see her, but not when she's got the fever. But anyway, she's better now, so I'm back. Um, and what we have been studying is data, like how to get data in your app. And uh, we learned how to do that previously from looking at REST APIs, um, like you know, accessing web services, these RESTful web services, right? And that's pretty common, like that's what a lot of apps do nowadays you know if you're making an app you connect to somebody's data maybe it's yours maybe it's someone else's I'm not gonna cover in great detail how to set up you know because like the data we got from those API's those people had to get the data from somewhere and they have to do some kind of work on their web server to like send that data back to you as JSON for your app to look at right and so if this were like a real full class of all the way end to end, I would teach you how to go set up a server and how to set up a repository of data in JSON format or how to send it back in JSON format or something like that. That's probably more in the scope of a web programming course like CS142. If that's what you're interested in, um, you can go learn about that. You set up a server with Node.js and MongoDB and this kind of stuff. And you, you send JSON stuff back to a, an app like, like we're writing, you know? Um, but I do want to talk about some of the other ways that you can store data in an app. I mean, we read data from files, and now we reach to web services to get data. And the next one I want to talk about is databases and SQL. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have ever queried a database using SQL? A few of you. I'm just curious, where, when, what, what occasion was it that you had to do that? Why did you do SQL? Was it for some other class or project you did or what? 145. For 145, you took you took the databases class. Okay. Anybody else? Was, were you all in 145? <laughs> Is that okay? Well, uh, fine. So okay, I'll just jump to my my slides here. Uh, wait, 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 wait. This is the wrong. Um, this isn't the right link. It's supposed to be .dot uh, html. I have the slides up in PDF format, but those are last year's slides. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the link to the slides on the web page here goes to last year's slides, which are a PDF document. And I just noticed it just now. Um, but if you edit the link and type .html, it will be the right slides. I'll fix it after class. Um, so databases, I want to talk about databases for, for today's lecture. Um, a database is basically a data structure on steroids, you might say. It's a way that servers and apps can store large amounts of data along with set of operations to search and modify that data. And so a database might be the way that a server would store all of that JSON information that's being sent back to your apps. Now, uh, databases have changed a lot over the years. Uh, when I went to school, the sort of dominant type of database that everybody was using was called a relational database. and um, Relational database thinks of data as being stored into tables. Tables have rows and columns. So back when I was a student, the analogy that I wish my teacher had made for me is like, it's like having lots of Excel spreadsheets together. That's a database. So one Excel spreadsheet with rows and columns. So a lot of you probably use Excel or Google Docs, Google Sheets or whatever. Um, if, if you look at this as rows and columns and you call that a table, then a collection of one or more tables would be called a database. Now, uh, why would you need one versus two versus 10 tables? Well, it kind of depends on what your data is. Maybe it's data about um, countries and cities and stuff. So maybe there's a table of countries, maybe there's a table of cities, maybe there's a table of, of other things like states. Um, maybe it's a um, students and courses database. So you might have a table of all the students at the university and a table of all the classes at the university. And so I'm just saying like, you wouldn't want to mush all of this into one table because you're storing different kinds of things. So um, you make a table for students, a table for courses, a table for majors, a table for prerequisites. I don't know what, you just would make lots of different tables for each different kind of thing that you're storing data about. Um, 
there's a little bit of an analogy to objects or classes or structures in programming. Like the rows of a table are often similar to objects, and the table itself is like a class. So like if you have a student's table, each of the rows is like a record of information about one student, and so on. So anyway, that's called a relational database. And this is a way that people have stored data for decades and decades and decades. Um, most databases are designed to be scalable and fast and allow you to search the data or loop through the data or look at the data. Um, pretty commonly, depending on what the app is doing, uh, there's a set of operations that are pretty common to provide that they call CRUD operations, which means create, read, update, and delete. So just read and write the data as you see fit. Although some apps only read. Like, you know, if, if the user is not trusted, we don't want the user to delete or modify what courses are offered at the university or something like that. But anyway, that's uh, sort of what a database is, a set of tables and a set of operations you could do on the data. Now, um, where does a database live? Where does it get stored? It could be one of any number of places. Uh, I think traditionally the most common was that there would be a, like a database server and other machines would connect to it and they would say, I'm searching for some data and the database server would send it back. Um, and that's still true in a lot of situations, but it could be stored locally like on your app, like your phone, your app on your phone could create its own little database and store things in it. And it could search the database and add things to the database over time and then all the data is kind of local, that would be fine too. Um, I guess which one is the best one kind of depends on what you're doing. You know, if the data is specific to you, you would want to store it locally. And if it's shared, you know, you make a post on the message board and somebody else wants to read your post, maybe you store the posts in a database. It wouldn't make sense for me to store my post on here because then, you know, if somebody else looks at her phone, she doesn't see my post because it's not on her phone. So it just depends what you're doing, you know? Um, so in class today, I'm going to teach you how to make a local database that lives on your device. And so um, a couple things that will come up when we do that. One is that uh, if we do this right, we actually won't need an internet connection anymore because we can just search through the data that's all sitting on our own phone. We don't have to connect to some URL or some website to get the data. Um, it also means that that could lead to some speed up because we're not waiting for the data to come back and so on. But we have to learn a little bit different way of asking for the data, querying the data, looking through the data, that sort of thing, okay? Um, so why, why would you want to use this? I mean, maybe it's not clear, like, what's the point of having a local database on your app? Well, I, I guess you have to think about the alternative. Like, if you just had a really big collection of data, what would it be? It would be an array list or a hash map or some, you, you probably think of data in programming as like a data structure, right? A collection class of some kind. And fine, you could store your data in that, but I mean, when the app shuts down, where are you going to put the data? What, would you open up a file, like a text file, and write the data out into a file, and then when you load the app up tomorrow, you're going to read all the data back from the file, right? You could do that. Sure, sure, fine, you can do that. But the problem is that when you start having like thousands and thousands and millions and millions of pieces of data, records of data in your collection, a lot of stuff starts to break down and you start to see the limits of conventional data structures. I mean, you could make a hash map with a million elements. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it starts to take up a lot of memory. You know, your app is running and you have this enormous data structure loaded into memory, that can be bad. Um, also, uh, you know, these data structures are often optimized for a few operations and not others. Like a hash map is optimized for searching for things based on a key, right? But it's not very good for like, find me all the students who have a GPA between 3.0 and 4.0 who took 106B two years ago in the fall. Like, how am I supposed to do that? I have to do some giant for loop and it's slow. And so I, I guess I want you to take my word for it that you, know, you guys may or may not have written apps that dealt with a large amount of data, but if you do, pretty quickly data structures start to kind of get in the way and break down and they're just not tailored to what you want to do. A database is optimized and, and you know built for these kinds of situations like an uber data structure it's powerful it's fast it scales up really well it's meant to be sort of abstract where you know once you learn about databases you can often carry that knowledge with you across different domains like a lot of the stuff I'll teach you today you could theoretically use 
in an iPhone app as well with a similar syntax or in a web app or any kind of app. If you wrote a, a Mac OS or Windows app that ran on the desktop, like in all these different kinds of situations, you might be able to sort of use a lot of the stuff I'm going to teach you today. So it's abstract in that way, which is nice. So anyway, that's, that's some of the motivation here. Um, and, you know, as some of the folks were saying that they took the 145 class, we have a whole class, undergrad class, on databases. And, I mean, there's a lot, you know, people get PhDs on databases and they study them and they research them and they make them better and faster. And so, like, a bunch of really smart people are trying to make these good, you know. And it's, there's depth to this. And, uh, you know, of course, I can't, I can't really, like, cover all that in one lecture. But let's try. So, uh, database... If you want to use a database, you have to have some sort of database library or database software or something like that that you can talk to. So it depends what you're doing. I mean, maybe you've heard of Microsoft Access. That's a database program. Or Microsoft SQL Server. That's a database program. Uh, you've probably heard of this company called Oracle. Their name is on the Warriors Arena, right? That's probably how you've heard of them. But <laughs> they, they uh, make database software. That's how they got rich, is making a really powerful database program. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of these, there's some of these kind of littler freebie database programs that have become really popular in open source software. MySQL is a really popular one. Uh, PostgreSQL is also very popular. And there's another one called SQLite or SQLite. Um, that is meant to be a really, really bare bones, lightweight, simple version of a database. And because it's so light, it is often sort of bundled into other libraries because it's not as bulky as trying to bundle any of these other things. And so Android and its API, its libraries, its frameworks already comes with this product built in called SQL Lite for, for database usage. So we're going to use that. Um, but the good news is you might say, well, geez, do you have to learn Oracle? Do you have to learn Microsoft? Do you have to learn MySQL? And I think the answer is no, not really. I mean, you, you pick one of these that's right for your situation. You install it on your server or on your device or whatever. And then you connect to it and you issue commands to it using a language called SQL. And all of these products, in theory, understand the same set of SQL commands. And so once you get one of these talking to you, it doesn't matter very much which one it is after that. They all sort of work in a similar way. And that's a really good thing. Um, so uh, you talk to a database using this SQL language. And several of my slides today are going to show you examples of this language. Uh, it is meant to be what's called a declarative language, where you, um, you say what you want from the data, and the database figures out how best to find it, you know? So uh, I'll tell you what all these things mean in a second, but if you say, give me the names of all the countries that have a population greater than uh, 20 million or whatever, that's what that query is asking for. And if you ask the database for that, it will go search, I don't know, this is some sort of world statistics database or something. It'll go search and find those and it'll give you give you those back. Although I guess it should only just give me back the names, not all this other stuff. But um, anyway, if you learn this language called SQL, if you ever have to interact with one of these databases, you say, oh, I know SQL, okay, and you just issue SQL queries or, or searches to it and it'll send you back the results and it's not so bad. Um, now, I will say you know, a, few, a few things here in terms of uh, context. SQL was like the, you know, lingua franca of databases um, until, I don't know, 10 years ago. Like, it was like the only way anybody did databases. You had to learn SQL. Every undergrad, you know, learned it or took database course and learned it. Did, so they do SQL still in the 145 class? Is that what I was hearing? They still teach you guys some of that? Yeah. A, a databases course is not just about that language and how to query a database. It's often about the the models and the theory and the way databases structure and store their data and stuff. There's more to it than just this sort of searching kind of stuff. But anyway, this was the way that you did databases until about 10 years ago. And then sort of a new paradigm started to emerge called NoSQL, <laughs> where people would just store their data in a different way, often as sort of a JSON blob somehow, <laughs> and that you would search it differently. And just they just kind of threw all this out. Um, but this is still very much in use. And um, I don't think it would be entirely correct to say that the, the no SQL way is replacing the SQL way. They sort of both exist now, and they're both used. Um, anyway, this language, if I teach you this, or if you learn about this language, you can use relational databases anywhere you want. 
So let me show you a little bit about it. I'm also going to show you, I, I guess one thing that's not clear from this slide is like, okay, fine, where do I type that? in my Android app. Like, how does this get back to this course, you know? And I'll show you that in a minute. I mean, if I teach you these commands, I will show you some places that you can type these commands in and see what, what they do. So, here are some examples of some databases. I'm going to refer to these databases in my slides a little bit. So here's an example of a database that I call Simpsons. And it's got some tables. This is like uh, people who go to a school. Maybe this is Springfield Elementary School on the Simpsons or something. Uh, I just heard they signed a deal for the Simpsons. They're going to have their 31st and 32nd seasons of the Simpsons. Uh, they just signed that contract to do that. And that, that blows my mind. Like, I uh, was the same age as Bart Simpson. Like, when the Simpsons started, it started in uh, either 89 or 90, depending on when you want to count and like Bart's 10 and like I was 10 and so I thought it was really cool because like I was the same age as Bart but what really fucks with my head is that now I'm the same age as Homer <laughs> <laughs> so that's really weird to me <laughs> dope <laughs> oh well <laughs> time comes for us all um, both the Simpsons and I have been around for a while uh, so anyway this is an example set of data from students and teachers and I, I made it up and I pulled the the names and stuff from uh, the Simpsons for the most part and so if you look at it there's like a table of students and each student has a name and an email address and there's a table of teachers and they have ID numbers and names and there's a table of courses and there's a table of grades and so uh, mostly I think this data probably makes sense but uh, one thing that's kind of weird is if you look at this grade table you see how it says like 1, 2, 3, and then 10,001, and then B minus. What does that mean exactly? What do you think is being represented by that row of data in just plain English? Yeah? It's a student's grade in a course. Okay, it is one student that took one course and they got a certain grade in it. And can you be more specific? Like the student ID matches up with the ID in the top left and the course ID with the Right, right. So the student ID 123 matches with the student ID up there for BART, and the course ID matches with that course ID right there for Computer Science 140. So what this means in English is that BART took Computer Science 142, and you got a B- in it. So I, I guess in a few minutes we could talk about why don't we just write BART here? Why don't we just write Computer Science 142 here? That seems like that would be easier to read. So why do we have these numbers instead of the names and the strings? So we can come back to that. But uh, a lot of databases have things like that where they will refer to something. It's almost like a pointer. You know, like if you go to there, you'll see what course they took. Oh, 142. Okay. Hey, I wonder who taught that course that Bart got a B minus in. Well, I'll go to the course. The teacher ID is 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, Ms. Krabappel taught that course. So sometimes you jump, jump, jump around. You you have rows that have relationships to other rows. That's why they call it a relational database, because there's a relationship between the values in one row and the values in another. So anyway, that's part of why they call it relational database. But anyway, that's an example there, Simpsons data. Uh, here's another example. I'm just trying to get you a sense of a feel for databases by showing you some examples here. Here's a database called World. There is a table of countries. So each table has a bunch of different information about each country. There were so many different columns, I couldn't fit them all. But it's like the name of the country, the population, the data is a little bit out of date. So uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, incorrect by now, but whatever. It used to be that Afghanistan had that population. There's a table of cities. There's a table of what languages are spoken in each country. So, you know, world information about countries and cities and stuff, right? Um, here's another one. This is IMDB, the Internet Movie Database. I'm sure you guys have... A lot of you probably looked up some information about an actor or a movie in the IMDB. They actually make their data available. You can download it. You can download the database itself as SQL uh, compatible data. And so I did that. And they have a bunch of different tables. They have a table for actors and name and gender. Uh, they have a uh, table of all movies that they have on their, in their records. There's a table of roles, like this actor was in this movie and he played this role. Um, they have a table of different information, like who directed a movie and what genre or genres was a movie part of. And there's a, I think there's a maybe one or two other tables, but that's an example of um, 
IMDB data. So uh, one thing that's interesting that, you know, I'm not going to go all into every detail about how the data gets stored, but one thing about databases is they typically don't really have a notion of a list or an array. So for example, if the same actor is in the same movie twice, they play two different characters. Like uh, I, just, I just watched a movie, Coming to America, with my wife. It's a really funny 1980s uh, comedy movie starring Eddie Murphy. And in this movie, like, he plays a lot of different characters with makeup. Uh, you probably never seen that movie, but he's in the Nutty Professor movie, and he plays his whole family with different makeup. And I don't, you probably don't know who Eddie Murphy is. He's the donkey in Stupid Shrek movie, okay? <laughs> That's what you might have seen. But anyway, movie where this guy plays more than one character, more than one role in the same film. To represent that in the database, you'd probably have multiple rows. You'd have Eddie Murphy's actor number, and that movie's movie number, and then the first role. And then another row with Eddie Murphy's actor number, the same movie number, and a different role. And so that's how you would represent that he played those two characters. Anyway, that's another database example. Um, any questions so far kind of about what is stored in a database, what a database is, why you want a database? I don't know, any of this stuff so far. Any questions? Can you leave a field blank? Well, it depends. Uh, when you create the database, you specify what's called the schema of the database. You specify what the tables are, what the columns are. Columns have types. Tables have different data types. And you can specify constraints. Like you can say this integer has to be positive. You can say this string has to be one of the following five values. So it's more of an enumeration. You can specify this thing is not allowed to be blank or this thing is allowed to be blank. So it depends on the person who makes the data set and what they want. Databases can do lots of things. I think in these particular databases, maybe it does require them to be non-blank, but that's just how they set up the data. Any other questions? OK, well, let's learn a little bit about this SQL language. And I, I guess the way I usually want to teach this is I'm going to show you some of these commands. And then as we get a little further along, I'm going to sort of try to plug them back into Android. I mean, I, I think maybe the weakness of how I'm presenting this is that I, I'm not connecting it to Android yet. But I mean, suffice it to say, I'm going to write some Android code with you in a few minutes where I'm going to have a database and I'm going to query it and get some data out of it. Like, just give me that, that uh, assumption for a minute here. So this SQL language. Um, I already had a slide with some of these bullet points on it, but the most common type of query that it has is what's called a select query. Select query is how you find data. I think the next slide has this. Yeah, the select statement. So searching for data, you write a select statement. You say, I want to select these columns from this table that meet the following condition. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, I think the people who designed SQL, I, I don't know if I like the way that they, that they designed it because um, the way I think of it is like, okay, what tables do I want to look at? That's the thing I think about first. And then I think about, okay, which of the rows from the table do I care about? That's the second thing I think about. Like, I don't want every country in the country's table. I want the ones that have a population of 20 million or more. Okay, so table filtering criteria of rows second. And then maybe third, I go, well, I only care about their names. I don't care about who the leader of the country is. And I don't care what the national language and the state bird of the country is. I don't care about that. I just want to know the names of those countries. So to me, it's like table, row filter, column filter. That's how I think of it from big to small. But SQL does it as columns first, and then table, and then row filter. You understand? So like this part right here tells you what columns you want. And this is the table from a table. And then this here is which rows. Like, how do you decide whether to include a row in the results or not? So that's the order. I think it's a little bit backwards. I wish they hadn't done it that way. But I think their goal was they wanted the, the um, syntax of SQL to have sort of a flow, an English flow to it, I guess. I don't know. Um, there's lots of variations of this. Uh, I'll show you some of them as we go along. You can say select star if you want all the columns. That's fine. A lot of queries say select star in them, but I think that can be wasteful because if you have like 30 columns, it, when, you, when you ask it for this data, it actually like has to go grab all of it and give it to you. And so you, you generally kind of want to constrain your query down to just the stuff you really want to look at. So um, if, you're, if you're searching and there might be duplicates, you can say select distinct, and then it only shows you unique occurrences of something. 
So, okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, question, yeah. Uh, what is the exact return type? Like, what does it, I'm getting to an example of what is it? Oh, yeah, 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 good. Um, what's the return type here? Well, I think, uh, I mean, there's two ways you could think of that. It's a very important question. Like, one way is sort of from the database perspective or the, you know, abstract, like, tables and rows perspective. What am I going to get? And then there's the, like, in my code, what variable type is it going to be? You know what I mean? And I think I would rather focus on that first question for the moment. Mm -hmm. And in a minute, I'll show you what variable type it's going to be. But I think just conceptually, from the database's point of view, you, um, where's, so like here, if you say select whatever from wherever, you know, if you, if you have a query like this, mm -hmm. it will send you back a table of results. Oh. And the columns of that table will be the ones you asked for. Oh. And the, where the data came from will be from the table you asked for. Mm. And which rows are in the table will be based on the where clause filter that you specified. Mm. Select name from countries where population is greater than this. You'll get back actually just this one column, all the countries that have that many people in them. Okay. So like, if I want to display population, then I'll have to also write column. Right. right, so if you want the name of the country and you want to know how many people it has in it, you'd say select name comma population, and then you'd get back this, and then the second column would be this. You'd get a two column result back. So I guess conceptually what you the return type here is a table of results. But it's technically a, a slice or a view of some other table. Okay. Now, I mean, in terms of the code, like what kind of, is this a 2D array or something? Um, I mean, I, I'll tell you in a minute, but I, I think the short answer is no, it's not a 2D array because sometimes these queries send back a million results and I don't want to have to build it a million element two-dimensional array. That takes a ton of memory. What they send back instead is kind of a, almost like an iterator object where you can say, give me the next row, give me the next row, give me the next row. And it sort of pulls one row at a time from the database. That way it doesn't have to store all of the result rows in the memory at once. But so what the return type is in your code is usually some sort of object that lets you fetch rows and look at them. And, and that varies from, and that's the part where it's different. Like I just said a few minutes ago, if you learn how to do this, you'll know how to do database stuff in Android and iPhone and web app and all that stuff. And that's true in the part of like the concept of it and the queries and the table that comes back. But in terms of what does that row fetcher object look like that's different in Android from iPhone, from web app, from everywhere. So that's the part where you, you say, okay, okay, what are the objects for SQL stuff in this library? You know what I mean? So um, anyway, we'll see that in a, in a minute. So where am I? Select statement. That's, that's the most basic. Like if you've seen an SQL query but you don't really know SQL, I bet you saw a select query. Like um, I've seen one. There's like jokes. People do jokes in SQL. They, they go like... Uh, select star from users where clue is greater than zero and then it's like no results found or something it's like ah, find all the users that have a clue none of them do you know it's like you see people like nerds wearing that kind of stuff right have you ever seen it no <laughs> it's like a thing i didn't make this up i swear wait 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 uh images uh sql joke shirt uh Select uh, <laughs> Titanic float none. That's a CSS joke. Uh, I thought, oh well. It's a good use of class time. Select beer from pub where date time greater than or equal to five o'clock. This is funny. Databases walk into a NoSQL bar, but they can't find a table because NoSQL doesn't use tables. That's a good one. Oh, well, whatever. We can look at this later, or you can look at it while I'm talking, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I mean, select queries. The most, most common query, this is like, please fetch me the data that meets the following search criteria. And you could imagine searching through a table, show me all the people taking this class that have at least 19 units so I can send them a warning, you're taking too many classes. Or, you know what I mean? Like, that's the sort of query that you would specify. Um, I have an app that I'm going to post for you. I actually don't have it posted yet, but I'm going to post an app on the class website that you can download and install on your emulator if you want that will let you do queries on uh, the databases that I showed you here today, like uh, 
uh, Simpsons and World and IMDb and all that stuff where you can type a query. I apologize, I don't have it ready today, but uh, it will be up later tonight where you can type in a query and you can say query and it'll show you the results as a table down below. So in that, if you want to like play with SQL, that'll be available soon. Um, so, okay, let's talk about Android for a minute. Like I wanted to get to the actual um, Android code here. Android activities have a method, a function, called open or create database. <laughs> Great method. Um, which, if you have a database in your app, it will open a connection to do queries on the database. And if you don't have such a database, it will make one for you. So you pass in three parameters. One is the name you want the database to have. One is uh, you have to say mode private because you don't want your data to be public to other apps on the phone. And then you pass null. I don't know why. And then after you have opened the database, you can call uh, some kind of method like execute SQL. And then in quotes as a string, you write an SQL query. So like when I taught you just now select whatever, in those quotes, you would write select whatever from wherever. So that's where you put the SQL like in your Android code as a string into this, as a parameter into this function. And I think you'll find some sort of thing vaguely like this will be what you'll use on every platform, okay? So uh, I'll show you a little bit more about it, but there's, like, the method you use depends on what kind of query you're doing. There are some queries that modify data that you say exec SQL, and then there's ones that return results like a search and use a method called raw query for that. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. If, you're, if your query is invalid, like if you have the wrong syntax for SQL in your, in your quoted string there, uh, it will throw an exception. So you have to look at your bottom of your Android Studio to see if you get an exception like that and figure out what's wrong with your SQL syntax. Um, I put this on the slide. I don't know if you need to know this, but like the actual data in the database does get saved to a file in your device in this weird folder, but you probably don't need to look at that. I mean, I just, somebody asked me once, because I think it bothered someone, it was a little bit abstract, like, okay, there's a database, but like, what is it? Where is it? What's going on here? And I wanted to tell them, like, on some level, it does go put it in a file somewhere, but it's some kind of weird blobby binary file that you don't want to read. You just want to use these methods to talk to. But, you know, it does get put somewhere on your device inside of here. So, okay, um, let's let me, I want to jump ahead for a second. I want to do something a little bit out of order. I want to like just do an example of this with you. So let me jump all the way to, let me see, where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Here, here's kind of what I want to code today with you guys, as much as we can get done. Um, you you might have done this name surfer program. A lot of 106A students do this program. Um, it's a program that has data about babies' names from the Social Security Administration. And it says uh, how popular a given baby's name was every decade. And so um, it, it, you, know, you could store this data in a file. In fact, on that homework assignment, it is stored in a file. But I think if you extrapolated, like what if there were lots more names and lots more years and the data became really big, the program might run really slowly. So hey, maybe that data should be in a database. And uh, it turns out I have made a database for that data. And there's two tables in this database. One is a table of rankings. And each row of the rankings table indicates a person's name. It is separated by sex, male and female. Uh, I know that uh, you know, this is probably not the class to figure out whether, you know, whether this is bad to include in the data. Like, you know, this is already a binary male and female data set. And I apologize for that. But that's what the data is that I have. So I'm just going to leave that the, that way. So it's got name, it's got sex, it's got um, the year that the data was pulled from, and then the popularity rank that the name had that year. So what this means is that in the year 1880, for boys, the name Aaron was the 133rd most popular name of, of all born in America. Okay, And then there's another row for Aaron for 1890. For 10 years later, Aaron's name got a little bit less popular he dropped to 148, presumably because Martin was on its ascension by then. So I bumped a couple names out or whatever or something. So do you understand, like, if you want the popularity for the name Aaron, it's not just one row in this table. It's like some number of rows in this table that indicate the popularity over time. Okay? Uh, separately, there's also a table called meanings. And there's only one row for a given name in here, but it's like, hey, the name Aaron means whatever. And I just made these up, these aren't real meanings, but like, it just tells you this name means this or whatever, and you, can, you could look up the, the origin of your name, you know? Uh, my name's Martin. 
and it comes from Mars, the Roman god of war. <laughs> so my name means I'm warlike or something, you know. So it's like, if you want your kid strong, name him Martin. Won't get him picked on or anything. Uh, won't, certainly won't be called Fartin Martin at an elementary school playground or, or nothing like that. No, no, great name. Warlike. Um, whatever, everybody's name uh, means something. So uh, that's the data. If we had that data as a database, could we use it to draw? You know, the, the homework assignment that I'm copying here is an assignment where you type in the name. This is a screenshot of the 106A type of assignment where you type in a name and you pick which sex and then you say graph and it draws the popularity from year to year, okay? So could we kind of recreate that as an Android app is the question using a database. Well, maybe first what we could do is just try to do a query on this data and see, you know, see if it works, right? So I have a project here called Name Surfer and I've set up like some of this and not all of it. So I have a layout here with a place you can type the name and click search. And in theory, it's going to draw stuff here, but we don't, let's not do that yet. Um, I, for the sex, I used this thing called a switch. I could have used a checkbox or something. Um, it's, it's way back in the widget lecture. It's just one of the, we haven't used it really, I don't think very much. It's just kind of a, it's like a Boolean on off um, switch checkboxy kind of thing. So I set it to have one setting of M and one of F so I could query the two sexes in the data. Um, yeah, so I've got a uh, an edit text here where you can type in the name you're searching for and then when you click this search button, it runs a function called search click. So like when they click that button, I want to search for the name that they have uh, typed. So let's talk about this for a second. If, um, if I go here to this activity, I've got a few constants like what the database name is. It's called baby names. I've got a starting and ending year, like those are the bounds of the data set. And I've got like the worst rank that I might want to include. Maybe anything worse than that, I won't leave it in or something. Um, so when you click that button, it runs a function named do query. So if you do a query, <clears throat> I have already written the code that like grabs the widget, the text that the user has typed, and it grabs the gender, the sex, I guess I should say, of you know, female or male. So now like I want to search the database for that. And basically what I'm looking for is I want to find all the rankings for this name with that given sex, you know? So maybe you could help me for a second. Like what is the query that I want to type in here? Um, if, I, if I show you these tables again, like how do I find all the popularities for the given name? Like what's the query for that? Somebody want to take a stab at it? Yeah? Select name.meaning from ranks meanings where name.meaning is whatever pressure you have. Name.meaning? So what do you mean by name.meaning? So the table and then the attribute in the table that you have. Sorry, meanings.meaning. Oh, I see, I see. Well, so if you say, you know, A dot B, and you're trying to say like table A column B, what you really mean is select B from A. Do you know what I mean? Like if the table you want is A, you say from A. So um, if I want the meanings column, like it would be more like that, you know what I mean? If you want to select the meaning column from the meanings table. But actually in this query, I want to get the rankings first. So actually I want to come back to that query that you're suggesting. If I want to look up the meaning of the name Aaron, I first want to know how popular the name Aaron was. So that's going to come from this ranks table. So if I do from ranks, well, if I want to know how popular the name was each year, I could say select rank from ranks and then that would give me back this column right here. Is that the only column I want or do I want any other columns? I could say select star if you want, but do I need any other columns? What do you think? Yeah? Need the year. It might be nice to know like in this year you got this ranking. That might be helpful. I guess you might be able to assume 
the first one is 1880 and the next one is 10 more. You, but I'm not certain if they're going to come back in that order, you know. So maybe I'll say select the year and the rank from ranks where what? Now, if you don't say where, you just say like that, what do you think the database gives you? Because every single row, the years and the ranks, so that would return quite a lot of rows. I could do that. I don't think I want to do that. Where what? Yeah? Like where your name is equal to the name Yeah, so basically I want the rows of data about this person's name, right? So the way you can do that is you can say where that, that name is this variable called name. And it's also, there's a column here called name, right? So where the value of the name column is what the user typed, like a dollar sign, you could insert a variable into a string with dollar sign. If it's a string, you're supposed to put quotation marks around it. So you can put apostrophe quotes inside of a double string if you want to. Uh, if I want it to be just the male version of Aaron or the female version of Aaron, you can say and sex equals uh, dollar sex like that so that would be val query equals that like that's that's an sql query that looks up hopefully this data so if you want to do that query on the database if i just jump back to my slide here oh well it's kind of off the uh where was it slide like 14 or something here the way that you open a database is you use this command here named open or create database so you say that, but the name of the database is not name. It's, I, I read a constant up here somewhere. I called it database name equals baby name. So I like that in case I want to change it to something else or you know, if I get a different data set. So I'll just write database name, and then you say mode private, and then you say null. So that's my database. And if I want to query it, I say db dot. Now there's two different methods. There's one called execute SQL, and there's one called raw query. This is the one I want. You pass the query of interest, and then since this is a dumb library, you pass null for no reason. Uh, so uh, we can talk about nulls and stuff in a minute. But that command will search the database for, um, for those results. Now, one thing that's a little bit missing here is like, wait, so I'm like opening up this database, but like how did the database, where, where is it? Did, did it just magically come to exist? Like, how come this app has this database to talk to? I'm going to show you that in a minute, but I mean, the short version is in my raw resource folder, I have a special file called babynames.sql, and I have run a command to, like, import that into my app. So the database is already here. Um, I'm going to show you how to, like, if I just give you a database file and you want your app to be able to use that, I will show you how to do that in a minute. But we're going to kind of operate in the world where that database is in here somehow already. Um, so that command uh, executes the query. So you asked a few minutes ago, what is a return type? Because this, you know, I might say like val result equals that. Okay, what is that? Is that a 2D array? What is it? Well, it's something called a cursor. Uh, and let me kind of talk about what that is now and how that works. So I want to like loop, right? There's some sort of set of results that are going to come back, a set of rows or a table or something comes back. I want to look at the data. I want to print it out or do something with it, right? So the way that you interact with the data is you use something called a cursor. And a cursor, just conceptually, is an object that's sort of looking at a given row of a result of a query. And whatever row it's looking at, you can say, give me the value of this column from the current row, and it'll give it to you. And you can also say, OK, I'm done with this row. I want to move to the next row. And you can't. You, sometimes you can go back. It depends the implementation. But most systems that interact with databases have some kind of model like this, where you don't just get all the data as a giant dump, like here's a big old array. You get a way to look at a row, and then you get a way to move on to the next row. And again, the main reason for that is memory usage, because a query could return a ton of rows. And you might not even want to look at all of them. You might want to look at the first three and then stop. And so you don't want to send back all million of them if you don't need all of them, right? So you get back an object called a cursor. And the cursor, here's an example of some of the methods that a cursor has. And I'll show you a more of a table of the methods in a second. But <clears throat> when you do the query, you get a cursor. And it has the method move to next, which means sort of move to the next row. 
And so you'd have to call that each time. It's like you do a loop where you repeatedly call that. Uh, move to next returns a Boolean of true if there is a next row and false if there isn't. So that while loop will stop when you run out of rows. And so inside the body of the while loop, you can grab the value of different columns. You could say, tell me what the column index is for ID, and it'll say zero. So then please give me the int at index zero, and it'll return the one, two, three as val ID. You could say, I want to know the person's email address, so give me the string at the column index for email. So I, mean, I think this is kind of dumb. I wish I could just say, get string email. But for some reason, whoever designed this stupid thing, they made it so that the, the way that you ask for the value of a column is you have to pass an int for its index. And you could just write zero and you could just write one, but I think the danger of that is that you're assuming kind of what the order of the columns is and stuff. Yeah. So when you get uh, a query back and you get a table like this, does the database have types stored for each of the cells? So like, does the database say that under ID all those numbers are going to be ints? Yes. Um, later in the slides, I'll show you like when you create a database or create a table, you basically say this first column is named ID and it's an int and the range of values is zero to whatever. And you specify types and constraints on each column. And so name is a string and email is a string and ID is an int. Of course, in your code, you can do whatever you want. Like you could say, I want to read the ID and then I want to turn it into a string and then I want to do this to it. But like in the database, it thinks of this as being an int. And if you tried to add a new row to this table, but the ID was like Marty, it would fail and it would say that's not a valid ID number, that's not a valid int. So the database does have its own notion of types and like you can try to enforce validity of data in certain ways in, at the database level. So anyway, uh, I think this is a little bit clunky, but it does allow us to access these pieces of data. So the result here that comes back from this raw query, I call it cursor or CR. Maybe I like kind of like CR because I'm going to type it a lot. Uh, CR. So then what you do is you say while the cursor is able to move to the next element, like while there is a next element, um, I'll process a row from the database results. Okay. And um, the remember that I wanted to select this year in the rank. So for each row that comes back, I could just say like, tell me the year and tell me the rank. So maybe val year equals um, cursor dot get the int at the column index for year. And then I could do the same thing for the rank, but it's the column index for rank, see? So now I have a year and a rank. So maybe, I mean, I just wanted to like run something and test it and stuff. So why don't I just do like log dot D Marty uh, name equals name, year equals year rank equals rank. So I'm just going to like print debug message of each of the rows that came back. We'll see if it works. And then when you're done, you're supposed to say cr.close. Uh, you're supposed to close the cursor when you're done with it. Well, I guess if you don't close it, it doesn't know that you're done talking to the database. And if your app ran for a long time and you had a, a bunch of cursors sitting around, maybe the database runs out of connections or something. So, um, okay, so I'll run this on my emulator. And hopefully, hopefully it'll work. Uh, the more fancy schmancy stuff we do, the more scared I get every time I try to run a demo. But we'll see. At least I don't need the internet for this one. That's the biggest thing. OK, so if I type in Martin, and I'm a dude, and I search, then hey, look at that. So. It, those, it printed all those lines. I don't know why it indented it that way, but in 1880, my name was the 44th. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've almost uniformly been dropping in popularity since the 1880s. Uh, I fell out of the top 100 here in the 80s. That's when I was born, was like right in between here. And so <laughs> it's just a precipitous drop for, for poor Martin. But um, anyway, th I'm getting data, right? And um, one thing that I think is maybe hard to impress upon you from this dumb demo, because I think you might be sort of looking at this code going like, oh, this is ugly looking. I don't know, what, what are we doing here? Uh, I want to stress that like, this is really fast. You know, It would have immediately returned these results, even if there were 20 million rows in that table. It's really cool. It's quite efficient. And if you had a hash table or an array list of 20 million 
elements in it and I said, hey, loop through all of them and find all the ones about Martin or whatever, it would not have printed that immediately. It would have taken a minute to look for that. So like one of the cool things about this, even though you're probably not thrilled with some of the weird code we have to write here, like once you get over that and get used to that, you can search enormous complicated data sets and very quickly get stuff out that's interesting to you based on different criteria that you're interested in. So uh, yeah, any questions uh, so far about what we've been doing? Yeah. Uh, is it not skipping over the first one? No, um, it just it. I mean, the slide. I didn't make this very clear from what I've been saying so far. But like, when you first do the query, the cursor is kind of like sitting before the first row. So when you say move to next, it sort of moves to the first row. So it, it doesn't skip anything. This turns out to to do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, wait, let me let me put the data on the screen while you while we answer that. Um, where is it? Slide thirty. Um, so why? So you're saying like why don't I need like ID numbers to get between the tables? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Um, well, I, I guess the short answer is that everybody who creates a database just they decide that. And some people decide that they want ID numbers, and some people decide that they don't want ID numbers. And actually, I have a slide or two on this if you want. Like the the tables that are related to each other. Oops, I guess I can't I can't get the size right. For, but um, when you have the ID numbers that connect one table to another, the main reason that you do that is because you're trying to avoid repeating strings. Because um, in this table here. I mean, it's one of the, it's like an implementation detail, but like the amount of memory that this table takes up is like the space for an int, the space for an int, and the space for a two-letter string. And so you could pack those rows in tight, like especially if you know that these ID numbers are in a certain range. Like all the IDs are five-digit numbers, then I can use this many bits for that int, and all these IDs are this range of numbers, so I can use this many bits for that int. So like the number of bytes that a row takes up here is very like predictable and not very many bytes. But if these have to be strings and the name of a course could be arbitrarily long, then you sort of have to make the rows big enough to fit all that. And so the, the like width, the number of bytes that each row takes up is more. And so the overall database just is bigger. So like it basically comes down to like ints are smaller than everything else is part of why you do this. Um, another reason you do this is because it's faster to compare. Like if you say, give me all the classes Ms. Krabappel taught, then you're sort of looking for the ones that have the teacher ID of uh, 1234, and it's faster to loop over all these rows and check if the int is equal to 1234, rather than checking if a string is equal to Krabappel because you have to compare the characters one by one, you know? So like, it, if you do this, it can make your database more compact and faster at the expense of it being harder for a human to read a little bit and having to like look at the two tables and connect them to each other, as opposed to the one we're doing with the um, you know the baby name surfer thing, uh, the data is not very complicated, and it wouldn't help us that much. Like I just decided not to do IDs. I could have done. I, I made this database basically, <laughs> so I could have made an ID column here. Aaron's ID is four five six. And then over here, I could have said person number 456 has the meaning of whatever. I certainly could have done that. But I just chose not to because there wasn't a lot of overlap and a lot of savings. But um, anyway, uh, that's that's my attempt to answer that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So if I wanted to find grades for Lisa, for example, then I would, like, I would need to do more than just like, student name. And I guess like, from the tables, um, from the data sets, I would just like, also need to find like, the students to do Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it starts to exit the scope of today's lecture or, or of our course. I mean, I think it's more in the boundaries of a database course. Like, if you have everything split up with these ID numbers and stuff, it makes it a little harder to answer a plain English question. Like, if I want to know what grades Lisa got in fall quarter, then I have to know, like, her ID. So why do I do one query to get her ID is 888, and then I do another query, give me all the rows where the student ID is 888. It seems like it means you have to do two queries now. Whereas if this just had Lisa in it, you could say, give me all the rows that have Lisa in it. You wouldn't have to talk to any other tables. Uh, basically, you do something called a join query, 
where you say like join grades and students together based on this column and then look for the rows that have this constraint. So you do something like, you know, select the grades from the student where, it, it, I don't want to go into all this, but basically you can sort of say link these two tables together. I want the rows where this ID matches that ID, link them together, and then give me the ones where it's named Lisa. And you, could, you can kind of rejoin the tables based on the IDs. So it's, it's a solvable problem with one query. Um, Anyway, so it looks like we are getting rows back from this database. That's cool. Let's talk about, uh, you know, I don't want to stray away from the database topic, but like it would be more fun if we could see the pretty line, right? <laughs> so uh, how do you do that? Well, I decided to get around that by uh, downloading a library called GraphView. <laughs> I mean, this should be your instinct, like if you just Google, how do I draw a line graph in Android? Maybe Android comes with that, and if it doesn't, there's probably some good library for it. I am not particularly trying to say that I have found the best library for drawing graphs in Android. I literally Googled it, and I just looked at the first few. I liked this one. So here you go. Um, there is a library called GraphView. You can tell it's legit because it's made by jjoe64. <laughs> JJO64 makes all the best stuff. Puts JJO32 to shame. Um, so if you want this library, you know, I, I, I feel like we're getting to the point where I can just say, here, add this library. You should know what I'm talking about. Like, put that in your build file. That's it. And then once you've done that, you can now put a widget in your layout that's called a graph view widget. You have to prefix it by this guy's package name or whatever. And then that's the start. So. Um, in this project here, I already have linked that library in. And down here, I have this J Joe thing. And so now in the middle of the screen here, there's a graph view, but it doesn't have any data in it. So I guess what I want to do is I want to take the stuff that comes out of this database query, and I want to draw it as a line graph using this library. So again, the point of the lecture is not this library. But if you want to make a graph, you just talk to it through its ID. You know, you can talk to widgets by their ID and stuff in your Kotlin code and you set some properties like the minimum and the maximum x and y that you want to look at and then that sets kind of the range of values you're going to draw and then if you want to add a line graph you make a line graph series and you make data points and you add them to the series and then this is cut off the slide but you you add the series to the graph so you make a series put points in it add it to the graph so i mean i just wanted to like quickly just slap this on the screen real fast um i think uh I think what I want to do here is uh, maybe when you construct the activity, I'll set up the graph. So in the in the XML, the graph has an ID called graph view. So now over here, I'll say graph view, graph view dot uh, set min x. What? Wait. Uh, bless you. Wait, what's going on here? Why can't I talk to this thing? Graph view. I know this word. I like did this before class. I promise. <laughs> um, the let me just make sure I have the library. Yeah, I have the library in here. Okay, okay. Uh, so why can't I do dot? Oh wait, am I not reading my own slide? I have to say dot viewport. Okay, sorry, I was being stupid. Um, dot viewport dot set min. You can set the minimum x, the maximum x, minimum y, maximum y. So, um, I mean, you could do this different ways, but like maybe uh, the years are on the x-axis and the rankings are on the y-axis. So maybe the minimum x is the start year. It wants you to do it as a double, so I'll say as double, or is it two double? For some reason, it won't auto-convert uh, ints into doubles in Kotlin. And I could set the maximum x to be the, the end year. What is it called? End year. And then the y, the um, minimum ranking would be like 0 or 1 or something like that. So um, maybe that's minimum y of 0 and the maximum y, I said somewhere I wanted the maximum rank of 2,000, so maybe like max 
rank dot to double something like that I mean we could I think there's more stuff you could you could set about this but um, let me see is there any other stuff I want to set is x axis bounds manual I don't know why if I want that or not but <laughs> you could you can set a title for the graph um, let's try to make a, a line series out of this so um, down here when you're doing the query on the database this is the part where I'm using that cursor to move to the next or something so maybe here I could say val series like a line series equals uh, so you write line graph series here oh do I need to write something in there uh, do I have to write data point so okay now for each of these points that comes out of here I'm going to add a point to the uh, to the series so I'll just say um, series dot add uh, isn't it called add append append data a data point and I'll put the X and the Y in here the X is the year and the Y is the rank uh, I think it doesn't work unless you say dot to double because Kotlin is dumb about that for some reason so wait why doesn't that work append data uh, oh I have to pass in false and max points I mean who cares right this library doesn't really matter I don't know why you have to pass a false and whatever max points I don't know why there's max points in here how many points should there be I don't know uh, val max points equals 20 I'm not I'm not sure wait I'm not sure why you have to pass a maximum number of points but oh well when I'm done with that let's say hey graph please um, add a series for this series of points I think you also can say graph view dot remove all series, like in case there was a previous line and delete it or something. So something like that. Uh, let's give it a try. This feels like one of those things that has about a 5% chance of working on the first try, but uh, I'm feeling lucky today. So let's see. I see things. It says 2, 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.50, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Great. Okay, whatever. I'm not sure why that's the labeling. Uh, how am I doing? Hey. Now, um, I think that um, I think this is wrong, right? Because uh, it makes it look like my name is getting more popular and I think my name is getting less popular so why you know why is it wrong why does it look wrong you know yeah well like your y axis is the flips so like the most popular names are at the bottom because they're like rank one right right so so like um one means I'm really popular so in theory I want that way up there but it doesn't think of it that way. So I think what I need to do is I need to say like, it's not really rank, but I probably want like, you know, oops, uh, sorry, I want, uh, blah, 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 blah. I probably want something like rank equals max rank minus rank. You know, I sort of want to flip it. If I'm up at one, I want to go, I, I, whatever. Like, and I probably want some sort of like bounding of bound it within the range or something but I don't know something more like that let me let me run it one more time and then we'll see if it looks a little bit better also I think the labeling on the axes is kind of wrong but it doesn't matter so I'll type in Martin and I'll search and <laughs> that's a little more like I'm I'm plummeting I suck so um uh, we can type in another one like Zelda for a female person and so Zelda's doing okay uh, I enjoy Adolf. That's a funny one for for boys. Uh, it's not doing as well. I don't uh, anyway, whatever. Like you can you can graph these different names. So I mean, I wanted to connect this to some actual program that we would write here and see how the data would turn out. But I was just using a pretty basic query there. So I wanted to jump back and um, talk about like 
a few other kinds of queries and things that you could do. And I also want to talk about kind of where did the data come from? Where did the database come from? Because I sort of said, oh, this app has a database. Ta-da, like don't worry about that part. So now I do want to worry about that part for a second. Um, one way that you can get a database to exist and have data in it, one way, is to import a file called an SQL file. And basically an SQL file is literally just a sequence of SQL statements that say add a new row to this table or add a new column to that table or whatever. And um, executing an SQL file involves just reading those statements and sending them as queries to the database. And so one way you could do this is you can uh, put a .sql file in your raw resource folder, just like you would for other input files. And then in your code, you could read that file using a scanner, read the lines, and then send them to the database and execute them as queries. And so like, I don't know if this is making any sense, but like, there is a file in my project called babynames.sql. If you open that file, it should be readable. It has a command like create a table. Now, I didn't teach you that command, but that is a command. And then it's like insert a row, insert a row, insert a row, insert a row. So this is just a whole bunch of queries. And if you tell your database object to run all these, it will add all of that. Basically, these are the commands necessary to create and populate that database. So like I wrote a function in this activity so you would think that there would be some sort of import mechanism, but there basically isn't. I wrote a function called import database. I create the database, I open a scanner to that file, and then I loop over the lines of the file, and then I execute each line as a query, basically. The reason the code looks a little confusing is you are allowed to have a multi-line query as long as it ends with a semicolon. So what my code does is it just reads lines until I see a semicolon, and then it executes that as a query, and then it starts over. So that looks a little weird, but that's how you get the data into the database. That's how you get the database into the app. You start with the file, you read the contents of the file, you tell the app to turn those contents into a database. That's how Android does it. If you have a server, what you would do instead is you would go open a terminal and there's usually a command line interface where you can say, I want to import this SQL file into my database system and it'll do it for you using that command line instead. So where would you execute this code to import this database? Probably, I mean, I already ran it. I guess that's the thing I want to emphasize is that the database persists. Like my app on my emulator has that database. Even if I quit the app, even if I reload the app, the database is still there. It doesn't go away when my app closes, right? But I didn't write any code that you saw to create the database. That's because I ran it before class and I created it. It's still there. But if it weren't there, I would probably need to do something here in like on create. And I would need to do something like, you know, import the database from uh, babynames.sql or whatever. But I would probably want to do something more like if there is no database, then import it. I don't want to import. It takes a minute to do all the importing, so only do it if you need to. Um, that's Anyway, that's where the data actually came from to populate this thing. So uh, that's basically that function that I just uh, that I just talked to you guys about. So I think it's almost criminal that Android does not come with a function to do this. I find this offensive. <laughs> this should be built in. And when I was learning Android for the first time, I was like, where is it? Where is it? And I Googled it, and a bunch of people had code like this on Stack Overflow. And I was like, no, no, give me that. Don't make me write that. Come on, that's just like a basic thing any, any person would want. Um, I thought I would show you something kind of cool. I did, I did discover there's something nice here. Um, and, uh, uh, Kotlin has a neat feature. It's called an extension function. I just want to show you this. It's not related to databases. But like if you make a new file and you just call it like uh, SQL sucks or something, I don't know what, then you can, a feature of Kotlin is you can add stuff to existing data types. Like that's not a thing that you could do in a lot of programming languages. But like, you know, the activity class that we extend in all of our um, assignments, you know, all of our activities, you could say like fun activity dot foo bar Britlin booyah or whatever. Now it says what's an activity you imported or whatever. Now I have just added a foobar function to the activity class. The Android activity, I didn't make a subclass, it's not an extension, it's not an inheritance, I just like added a class to added a method to that class. And now that I did that, I can actually write 
foo bar and there's a foo bar function it's there you know it's kind of cool so i i think what i would probably do if i were writing a lot of apps that did stuff with databases i would say well this thing to like import a database that's a pretty important thing every activity should know how to do that maybe so i might grab that and put it in sort of a utility file like sql sucks and i might say well this is uh, the activity dot import database function now every activity knows how to import a database in my project right here and then back in my project here if I say import database it knows how to do that it's kind of cool right so actually I think that means that you could you could write a nice library that would just like add functionality to existing parts of Android uh, and some libraries do do that actually yeah so uh, this code reads an SQ library SQL library that you already have downloaded into your project is would you use just like a different library if you wanted to download it from the internet instead? Right. So I guess you know all these things can kind of mix together. What if the data is on the internet? Well, you could download an SQL file from the internet and put that in your project. That might be fine. But what if your app dynamically on the fly wants to go grab the data? So you could grab the data from somewhere on the internet. What what sometimes happens instead of an SQL file is you start by creating an empty database. You just you create it and you make the tables and there's nothing in it. But then as the app is running, you're adding rows to tables. Maybe it's a maybe the database is a log of your location and your, you know, a heart rate because it's a running app. And so every 30 seconds I log those things. And so I just store those as rows in a table that's getting bigger and bigger over time. And then if you want to track your runs, I query my own table that I have been building over time as opposed to like I already have a bunch of data you know what I mean? So it kind of depends on what the data is, where it's coming from. Um, so yeah, like if the data did come from the internet, you could do some kind of web thing to get the data and then put it into a database. That would be fine. And then you would have a local cache, a local copy of it as well. So that would be fine to do that as well. Um, you might sort of say, well, I want to sort of say if I need to, then I will import this database. But how do I know if I already have the database or not? Um, I think that what you can do is you can say every activity has a function. This is on a slide, I think. You could say get database path for baby names. If that exists, then you don't need to create it. So I think if it doesn't exist, you have to import it. It's something like that. Like if the database doesn't exist, import it, you know? Um, anyway, so that's kind of how to get it running in your Android app. Uh, let me show you a couple other things about the query syntax and then we'll call it a day. Um, because depending on what you want, you might want to express a query in a little more complicated way. I was showing like select from where. The where clause can have a lot of different operators in it. You can say where the population is greater than or less than something. You can use these relational operators. You can use not equal, like less than greater than or not equal. You can say where the population is between this and that. You can say where the population matches this pattern, where it's like that. <laughs> well, that means it starts with United. Uh, the percent sign is kind of like a star wild card. You can say where the name of the country is in this list, and it'll find all the rows where it matches one of those things. Um, you can say and and or. Uh, I don't think the or made it on the slide cut here, but you could say and and or. I think that's what we did in our in our example in the in the code. We said where the name is this and the sex is that. You know. Um, there's a few other things you can say you want to sort them like the the data that we looked at from the uh, uh, the, the baby name database it was already kind of sorted so if you just graph the data points I think they came out in the chronological order but some databases aren't as neatly sorted as that so you can say order by year in fact I mean you should do it anyway like in the query that we did here you should probably say uh, where the name is this and the sex is that, you should probably say order by year to make sure that you get 1880, then 1890, then 1900, and so on, right? You can say limit. I only want back uh, the first five results. That's a good way of making sure, like, oops, what if there's a million rows about Aaron for some reason? I don't want that. Just give me the first 10 or give me whatever. That's a good, good sanity check. A um, couple other things. Uh, I, I think I'll stop in just a second, but there is a whole language here that I'm just like not going to teach you. Like select is mostly what you want, but there's language for like inserting a new row into an existing table, replacing or updating an existing row, for deleting a row. I mean, I got slides on all that stuff, but I wasn't anticipating that I would get to them. So 
Anyway, that's how to query a database. Now, if you're trying to figure out what's better, this one or the REST API one, it's not really the right way to think of it. There's not one that's better than the other. It's just like it depends where the data is, who has control of the data, what you want to do with the data. Sometimes the REST API is the right model. Sometimes this is the right model. It depends. So I'll stop there. Um, have a great weekend. And next week we'll do even more data. So see you then.